You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to episode 94 of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me is the esteemed Daniel Aaron Dilger. Hey, good morning from the other side of Los Angeles. Yeah, I, it, it's a weird coincidence that we're in the same town for once, more or less, and, <laughs> you know, basically an hour's well, drive say, apart. You say town, and it's kind of like we're, there's several, well, several cities between us, actually. Los this Angeles, kind of if, all if you've covered. Re- never looked at the map, Los Angeles is a, a name that covers kind of a giant sprawling area, right? Right. There's There's Los Angeles itself. And there's Hollywood, which is a separate thing, and there's Beverly Hills, which is a separate thing. But you know, you say LA, and you basically talk about this huge, giant region. And so yeah. I'm on the very far east side of this thing, and and Dan, lucky him, is over near Santa Monica. Yeah, I uh, I put some pictures. I was, I was out riding my bike in Santa Monica on one of these beautiful days out here on the, on the beach, and uh, I went past the Third Street Promenade store, Promenade. How do they say yeah. it? Um, yeah, I'd seen it before, but it's, it's one of their flagship stores with the, the front is all glass and the, the entire ceiling is glass. I think there's a building like that in Chicago as well, trying yes. to fix. but, uh, it's a spectacular building. Yeah. So you go down there and this is an interesting part of, of town. So there's this, this, uh, it's a street that's been turned into a walking mall basically. And on the right side of the street, as you're, you're coming from one direction, is the Apple store. And on the opposite side of the street is a Verizon corporate store. And so you have these this interesting kind of juxtaposition of the Apple store with its elegance and its beauty. And the Verizon store is not bad either. The Verizon store has a great focus on Internet of Things products. So you have works with Nest and HomeKit and, and cool stuff like that in there that they've set up that's demonstrable. You can play with all the goodies. So – it's it's a great kind of walking area to be able to check out what Apple's done and what Verizon's trying to do and, and how people are trying to put together what, what it means to have accessories in this modern era. And I was riding around thinking this would be a great place to live, you know, actually near the beach in Santa Monica or Venice Beach, whatever. And then I started looking at rent and it's <laughs> it's insane. Not just because it's a nice place to live, but also because all these companies have been moving down here, Google and Snapchat and all these companies have turned it into, it's kind of a microcosm of Silicon Valley in San Francisco where things are getting just out of control. Yeah. So I had to rethink that situation. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but, but yeah, if you have a, if you have a beautiful house in Santa Monica and you want me to live in your basement, <laughs> just let me know. <laughs> in, in the car park. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll set up in your garage. Yeah. yeah. Have you been down to the boardwalk? Yeah. Yeah. I was checking out down there. It happened to be really nice the day that I went down there. So I was taking a day off and, it's great. Also, right. um, there's other parts of LA that are. A lot of LA is is it just feels kind of famous to be there, you know. You know, you're going through Hollywood and it's kind of tourist and whatever. But uh, just there's so many palm trees and things everywhere, and it, they're not native to LA. It's all it's, it's almost kind of like a pre-Vegas Vegas, where I think kind of in the 20s when the movie industry started coming here, there was this fascination with uh, everything Egyptian, and so one of the things was they were planting palm trees, and they have these boulevards of palm trees everywhere um, that are kind of ridiculous for this area. Uh, And they're also now a hundred years old. So they're starting to reach the end of their lifespan. So they're trying to figure out how to do it. It, But now it's kind of, um, it looks like LA to see pictures of this kind of stuff where you're walking around and it's just a very like LA look, even though it's has nothing to do with the actual environment of the, you know, the natural area of this part of the world. Yeah. Well, the, the natural area of this part of the world is changing rapidly anyway with the rerouting of the uh, the river and, and all of that. The um, the neat thing about L.A. historically is is that you can look at old maps where they decided what to use for shooting locations in the area. You know, And they, they mark off that different regions of the, the vicinity represented different countries or different other parts of the U.S. And so you know, with an hour's drive north, that's a shooting location for the other side of the country kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and and cool if you're, if you're walking around Santa Monica, especially, but, but other parts of the city too, you can see places that have clearly been location shoots for shows and movies that you know. Just because yeah. the industry's already here, they use what's local. One of the one of the freeways that they were kind of one of the huge last freeways they were building in the '70s. Uh, I remember growing up 
watching chips <laughs> and it's like uh, that was obviously John, yeah. yeah and you know there was always a scene in almost every episode where a car like flips over and they have to get the person out before it explodes but it was all done when they're building this freeway because they had this, uh, this huge freeway to film on so it was a very, very cool. my my impression of california was sort of created in that era and then i moved here and was like oh that's that's where this was done yeah, and, and of course, that's not how things are at all anymore. But Yeah, now they're full of backed-up cars. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and downtown LA is kind of interesting. It's been kind of a decrepit rain for a long time, and it's starting to turn around and become a... It feels more like a city now. It feels kind of like a big Oakland, actually. But there's parts of it that are really... They have a lot of cool old lofts and stuff. It's kind of expensive, though. Well, I'm confident you'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm trying so let's talk about Apple stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Apple stuff. All right. Well, you know, we, we should talk a little bit about deals, right? Um, it is possible to save up to $400 on a 15-inch MacBook Pro that's back in stock or pick up an Apple Watch Series 2, you know, the 42 millimeter with the pearl woven band for $399 with no tax outside New York. And you can avoid Apple's two- to three-week wait time. Unlocked iPhone 7s are also $15 off with no tax. Uh, I, I know that's not a huge savings, but hey, we'll take what we can get. And a 512 gig 2015 12-inch MacBook is $899.95. And the 12-inch uh, iPad Pros 128 gig cellular are also marked down to 619, which represents kind of a huge savings. That's that's not bad at all. We have links to these deals and more in the show notes, and we'll make sure that, that they're available for you. If you happen to need a Mac, if you want to, to go ahead and get one of these MacBook Pros, uh, this is a good time to do it. We'll be sure to link to that. So, Dan, you and I were beginning to talk about the the issues with the uh, MacBook Pro and people's disappointment with it. And go ahead and speak to that for me a little bit. Well, I mean, whenever I read an article where it says people are doing this, uh, you have to stop and think, wait a minute, people? Is, it, is that a majority or is that – Two people, or what does that mean when you well, use a people? plural? And uh, what we what we see a lot of times is there's a lot of commentary from specific people, some of whom are, have a kind of a reputation of being, you know, big opinions on expressing things. Um, and I think they get a lot of play, but you have to remember that it's not representative of the market. So if you look at the actual sales, there was some sales data from Slice that was just published. Um, MacBook Pro, the new models are selling really well. And part of that is because Apple hasn't updated Macs of any kind in a while, and, and Mac Pros were overdue for being updated. So there's a backlog of interest. But uh, at the same time, if they were terrible machines, they wouldn't be popular even if there was a backlog. People would be looking at other options. Um, these are nice machines, and there's a lot of nice things about them. There's been criticism uh, about a variety of things and I've read some of the criticism, and a lot of it does make sense for some people. But it kind of comes down to an issue. I've been thinking about this and, and trying to work it into an article. If you look at how Apple makes its money, particularly since the iPad exploded, or the iPod exploded, the iPhone, and then with iPads, it's been using design to create really desirable, really well-built small devices that are thin and light and run forever on a battery, and that translates really well for notebooks as well. You can make a really nice notebook that looks kind of like an iPad with a keyboard, like the MacBook, uh, Ret the Retina MacBook that came out. Mm -hmm. um, the MacBook Pros are kind of an evolution of that. It's bigger and um, has more power. Uh, it starts to become less... Uh, Apple's formula for su success starts to become less and less uh, successful or valuable when it becomes stretched into the things that PCs are good at. So, for example, if you look at the things that have never really taken off, starting with the XServe, all the things that are great about Apple don't really translate to a server because people who want to run a server have needs that aren't really about design. They don't care how it looks so much, if it's in a server closet. Um, and the things that Apple is good at, even though if you look at the XServe, it was actually priced really well price competitive. Well, and, and with the XServe specifically, you got OS 10 server, which gave you great management tools for many things. And some of those tools Simple were specific tools. 
they, oh, okay. So uh, simplified management tools that made it easy to manage things that were otherwise harder. Right. And those appeal to people who don't buy a lot of servers. The people who buy a lot of servers don't need that kind of thing or that they, they don't care about it as much. They're, they right. already have the infrastructure to do complicated things and to deal with very complicated scenarios where you're building a, a very specific right. so machine if, that you want to do something that Apple was not accommodating. Right. But if you were building a Mac lab, for example, and you wanted to net boot, then, right. then you would get an XServe because the tools made that easy to do. Right. But that's sort of a niche thing. Yes, it is. If you look at the actual server market, they're not doing things like that. They're, they're you know, doing production environments for web databases and stuff where, where Apple was just not a valuable thing. So XServe is one example of what Apple's good at, not really being good at something that what PCs are good at. Another it, example, it, it, on the other end... It solved a problem that wasn't there. Yeah, it, it, it solved a, a minor problem, like the one you're describing. There's a lot of people who could benefit from it, but it was, it was not selling in enough quantity for Apple to make enough money on it to really put enough effort into making it really good for those people. And for everybody else, it didn't really serve their needs either. So that's on, like the big iron. And if you go the totally opposite direction towards the Mac Mini, which has also been you know, not really very... And, and by the way, I loved and had uh, had friends and clients that loved. Yeah, but when you look at the volume of people that are buying computers, people are not buying desktop computers anymore yeah. in, in big quantities. There's some people that want to buy them. There's some people that will put it and hook it up to their television and you know make a fairly expensive you know, Roku on steroids I, with it. I just had a, a set of friends who I've known for a long time purchase another Mac Mini. And and it was after a long deliberation of trying to decide if they should wait to see if if a fresh one was introduced or not. But they uh, they bought the last Mac Mini in 2007 when I told them to get it, and they called me up and said, "It's been 10 years. We're having some trouble." And I said, "Well, you know what? It's been 10 years. Go buy another." Yeah. So if you have a few friends that buy it every 10 years, it's not going to be a very successful. It's product. not a sales pitch. And, yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you can address the needs of a lot of those things with a computer that costs less. On the PC side, and in general, it's just not that big of a, a market. Well, the the reason it, it, the, why they Apple were doing sells. it was that they wanted an affordable Macintosh. They they wanted right. Mac OS, but they didn't want to have to go all in on the iMac screen, for example. So there's a there's a number of people, and then another example of that is of course the Mac Pro, which when it came out, it was like this is a nice looking machine, but how would you upgrade it? And then you know, sure enough, Apple is the only one that can upgrade it, and Apple is not upgrading it for going on what three years now. Yeah. So you can't you can't just pop in you know a, a GPU upgrade or a CPU upgrade, and they've made some you know like little bumps to the memory or things like that. But it, it's just not progressing as a device. And if you look at why, it's because Apple's not selling enough of them to to warrant that. Yeah. And so, what is a solution for these kind of corner case things that you know? The only reason to have these products is that people want to run macOS on it. They want to have you know like a, a small computer. They want to have a powerful computer. They want to have a server running Mac OS. But those are such small businesses that it's hard for Apple to focus its resources on. So the question is, how do you do that? Does Apple make a, a product like the Mac Pro that is expandable by other companies? Because that would sort of make sense if they made like a you know an MFI program for CPU sleds and just delegated the task of updating this machine to other companies that you know, are, are small enough to where that's a, a big enough deal for them to work on. That would sort of make sense. People have also floated the idea of Apple, you know, spinning off these things so that they're basically licensing Mac OS to other companies, which is, you know, kind of a, a further thing of that. That doesn't really seem like something Apple wants to do. And it would really water down. If you look at the Mac Pro, what the, the best things about it are the tight integration with the development of Mac OS and things like that. That it just it just seems like there's a lot of things outside of the core mobile devices and, and now notebooks that just don't make sense for anybody. And so it's, it's kind of a problem, but, but that's, that's kind of the reality. And a lot, I think a lot of the uh, criticism of that we've seen people talking about the MacBook pro that just came out is that there is not a Mac pro, a modern Mac pro to buy. There's not a Mac mini or, or um, well, I, I want to separate out this criticism a little bit, right? Okay. There, there, there are, as I see it, two different veins of this criticism. And you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here. But, but the way I see it is that there's, first of all, the, the criticism by pro users who say that this is not a pro-level machine. 
And they're saying that because of the GPU. They're saying that because of the CPU. And they're saying that because of the, uh, the, the 16 gigabytes of RAM, which they consider a starting point at this time, and the lack of, of whatever favored slot or port that they use. And if you look at the people that are saying this, I've seen, <clears throat> I, see, I saw one article from a developer who does a lot of cross-platform web development. So he uses virtual machines. So he's booting up entire you know, instances of other computers, like running Windows or something, yeah. running a browser that doesn't run that natively on the Mac, on a notebook computer. Which and is a fairly thing normal that, thing to do. That's not outside the norm. Is, is 16 gigabytes. But for um, Apple's developers... That's developers are, are a small part of Apple's business. They're an important part because the only way to, to develop um, iOS apps is on a Macintosh. So all of Apple's iOS developers, and some of those need to have run multiple instances of you know different versions or whatever. Um, so yes, there is something about that. And if you were a pro, if you if you have those kinds of needs, it would make sense to either have a Mac Pro that's modern and up to date, or to have a computer that looks like the PCs that they're talking about that have, like you say, a, a desktop class GPU and you know tons of memory, more than 16 gigabytes, and some of these other features. And the only computers that are like that look like a power book from 10 years ago. They're huge and thick and, you know... Th- well, they, they have to be just necessary. because of thermal yeah. right? Yeah, because it just creates too much heat and they're, they're big components and stuff. And that's a... How many hundreds of people are going to buy that? And at what, what price? Yeah. And, and, if, you, and if, price... You look at the, if you look at the PCs that are making products like that, like um, I can't remember the brand, brand name offhand, but there's a couple companies that do make machines like this, a lot of them for game uh, PC gamers, but they are tiny markets. They are not, they're not necessarily cheap, but they're not profitable at all. Okay. So to, to look at Apple and say, oh, why aren't you making this machine? Oh, duh. That's why they're not making it because, you know, there's like a handful of people that would buy that. Okay. So let and me – It's also let me, completely out of Apple's – everything that Apple's good at doing. Let, let me talk about the other type of user that I've seen with this kind of criticism and, and it's a specific person in here. It's not a, a generalized thing. It's a friend of mine. So I have a friend who has been for some time now – for, for about a year, talking about getting a computer for his daughter who is in high school. And obviously, he wants this purchase to last. And as we know, Macs tend to last for a few years, right? People keep their Macs for five years easy. And so he wants to buy a, a very competent machine so that it will have that longevity. And he got sticker shock because he was looking at the, the MacBook Pro and looking at what it comes with, and he felt like it wasn't a good value for money and that the price was significantly more than MacBook Pros have cost in the past. Um, I haven't exhaustively looked at this, but when I look at the prices of previous MacBooks, I don't see a huge... Uh, yeah. I don't see that well, the price has gone I, up tremendously. When I think about the last time that I personally purchased a MacBook Pro, I go back to about 2010, and the MacBook Pro at the time that I got was, cost 1500 It was a $1,499 machine. What machine was that? It was a 15-inch uh, Core i5. In 2010? Yeah. So I, shortly after that, I bought the 17-inch, you know, the huge yeah. <laughs> aircraft carrier yep. machine. And it Probably was not... Probably the last of the 17-inch. It, yeah, it was, I think it was one of the last generations. I may have made one more after that. But um, yeah, it was, it was not cheap. And after that, I bought a, a MacBook Air... Right. I, I bought an Air S soon after. Which was later. not as fast and not nearly as big. And I use it all the time. And the 17, I like sat on my, it sat on my desk like an like a iMac. And if you, you know, all these people say, oh, why is Apple making things thin and light and that's so stupid? I want to have things big and thick and heavy and powerful. Guess what? Apple knows what sells. That's why Apple <laughs> makes all the money. Well, that's why I went to a MacBook Apple Air from the, that data. Core i5 15 inch because it was trade off from between four pounds to about two pounds. Um, yeah, weight the, is so incredibly heavy. I've been talking to a lot of people, and you know, when you actually work on a mobile computer and you put it in your backpack and you lug it around, having that's why the Air was so popular, even though it was but, not a cheap machine when it came out. 
but, but wait for a second, because when I had the, the MacBook Pro, when I was using that Core i5 machine, I had it loaded up with 8 gig of RAM, which was at the time the top that I could get into it affordably. Um, and I went to the MacBook Air, which was a Core i7. It was a custom order Core i7, 256 gig with 4 gig of RAM, which was the max at the time. And I really did bump up against that limit. Yeah, There were a lot of times where I felt the performance uh, really pinch on that MacBook Air. So I totally understand why my friend is, is trying to make the right decision here and is, is at a loss because of, of the price. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's trade-offs. Like the, the Air that I bought, had a, it was the highest-end Core i7 yeah. that was available, but it still only came with 4 gigs of RAM. I mean, it was right, so you and I both that. bought that in 2011. Yeah, it's probably similar. So, um, despite despite trying to be fast, it is not a fast machine. And like I said, I had this old seventeen inch you know clunker that was faster and had more had at least twice as much RAM. Yeah, but you couldn't carry it anywhere. And yeah, but it was like harder to lug around. And so I found so, myself using the Air, even though the screen is smaller and you know it's not going to be as fast for a number of reasons. And it has fewer ports. It only had USB on it, and you know the seventeen had every port. It had two versions of FireWire and, you know, had a card slot and all this crazy stuff. Um, so so what do you recommend for, for my friend and his, you know, this, I know it's buying advice for one person, but I, for obviously our listeners who are going through the same kind of thing, what, what do you recommend for the person who wants to buy a machine that will be somewhat long-lived but is also concerned about price? What, what do you look at for, for that user? Well, one of the things you should consider when you're looking at price is resale value. So if you buy something that's minimally spec to save money, and then you want to sell it later, um, it may be obsolete before you can sell it for as much. At the same time, however, I, I think I think um, resale value applies more to Apple's iOS devices. You know, I've never really flipped a Mac. I, I've flipped iOS devices every other year or so, but I've never really sold my Macs. I tend to keep them. And it's kind of like when you buy a, a luxury car, too. I mean, you can put yeah. a lot of bells and whistles on it, and it'll be nicer to drive. But when you go to resell it, it's not necessarily going to – yeah, it's not necessarily going to prop up the value so much as the overall value, you know, quality of the right. car. And, and so I tend to – when I'm looking at these machines, I tend to want to go with not the bottom of the line and not the top of the line. I'll pick the middle of the road one. It's reasonable. Um, it, it, it tends to give me a good mix of – personally of, of capability – uh, versus price, and when you do go to sell them, or if you if you actually decide to sell them, you have less depreciation, right? And it's, it's easier it's to a, sell them because you're not asking for the premium for the top model. Yeah, and the very high end options, like the most storage and the highest CPU, those those are things that add price most dramatically. Yeah, um, I would I would always recommend the most RAM you can afford. Right. But so, so in this case, what, what do we pick for the prospective person looking at MacBook Pros and saying too expensive and, and not pleased with the mix of what's inside them either? Well, I mean, you don't really have a lot of options. It's, it's kind of like a take it or leave it sort of deal. Um, I don't think that's going to change in the future. No. And, um, you know, Apple doesn't discount some machines after a few months, so it doesn't really make sense to wait. Um, so it's kind of a decision of do you want to do you want to invest in getting a, a longer term machine or you know the other option of course is looking at buying an existing machine because there hasn't been a tremendous difference in processing power the the newest machines are very fast with their SSD technology Apple's really pushing that hard yeah um, which has a big impact over I mean obviously it's much faster than anything like a spinning and, disk drive and actually. We ran a story this week about that. We said that uh, Apple's engineering a new MacBook Pro paves the way for a speedy Optane storage in future models. So they've they've set the table for inclusion of a even faster SSD. Right, and even now Apple is about a year ahead of the mainstream PC industry in terms of notebooks and, and the speed of their SSDs because most um, most PC laptops use SATA three interface yeah. for um, SSD. It's solid state drive. It's not spinning. It's just chips. Um, so that makes a huge difference in how fast you do things like boot up the computer and launch apps and open up documents. It's, you know, it's kind of instantaneous as opposed to waiting for the disk to spin up and things like that. 
Right. And so to put it in perspective, the uh, a, a spinning hard drive is about 10,000 times slower than LPDDR3 RAM. Conventional SSD is about 100 times slower than that RAM. Uh, with Apple's drives in the current MacBook Pro, the very newest one, it's about 65 times slower. The proposed Optane storage media is only about eight times slower. So things get very, very quick indeed. So Apple's current uh, SSDs are about twice as fast, or more than that, I think. I mean, I think it's like two or three times multiplier, depending on the model, than the typical PC SSD. And it's, of course, many times faster than, I mean, it's like a night and day difference of a spinning drive. Uh, that's that's all kind of important um, in terms of storage. It also re um, relates to virtual memory, too. I mean, you start running up, if you're going to, like, be using so, tons of stuff at once. Vir virtual memory, for, for listeners who aren't familiar with the term, is the idea that when, when you're using your computer, things get stored in RAM. Things get stored in memory. When you run out of available memory to store things, the computer starts using the hard disk. And when you had a spinning hard drive with a magnetic spinning hard drive, that was very slow. But by paging to a, uh, an SSD, you get a lot faster. Right. So the memory it's not using in, in RAM is saved off uh, to the hard drive so that it can use available memory for new things you're opening, like if you're opening new tabs or whatever. Um, so yeah, if you have a really fast storage system, that makes up for the fact that you're doing paging as you begin to run out of use available RAM. So that's another way that storage, Apple's super speedy storage is important. And a lot of the criticism, like if you look at some of these articles, The Verge ran one saying, oh, the MacBook, MacBook Pro is a lie. They said, because <laughs> it's not Right, right. It's not that's really that's essentially the argument that it's not for pros. They completely jumped over that. He acknowledges like, oh yeah, it's, you know, the storage is really fast, but it doesn't, you know, it has 16 gigs of RAM. He doesn't explain why the storage is fast or what that even means. Or it doesn't explain why you've only got 16 gig of RAM. Yeah, right. it's like, they, that's they, actually a limitation of the chipset. You just cannot have more RAM than that. And people are like, oh, why don't they have more RAM? It's like, well, what are you even asking for? I mean, the only way you can have more RAM is if you become closer There's to being a desktop chip. machine. Well, yeah, if, if you, chip. yeah, if, so if, if, you, if you don't use this very fast RAM, if you use slower RAM, you can have more, but that's a compromise. Yeah. It's, it's this dumbing down journalism where you, you say things that kind of sound plausible, but you don't really articulate any reasons for anything and you don't explain what's happening. You just say things that get people like emotionally upset about what's going on. And it's really, I find it really, um, it's very much a Facebook thing. Like when I read my Facebook feed, I just get outraged and I'm realizing it's like, this is all garbage. I don't read a Facebook everything feed. Is, everything is lies. I really try not to. Yeah, it's, it's a bad deal. I, I think our society is collapsing because, uh, because now, of that. Now, We're now, now. Let's, trading let's, news let's, for just entertainment. I, I'd rather talk about MacBook Pros than this collapse of society. Well, this is kind of part of it too. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 think the, the, I think the difficulty is that Apple – and it's, it's difficult to say this properly, so forgive me. But my, my thought is that somehow Apple didn't do a sufficient job of explaining this at the front end of it, right? They, they, they came out and they talked about how great it was and they demonstrated how great it was. But if, if they had somehow addressed these concerns at the outset, then they would have headed off a lot of this criticism, so you think Apple should have stood up and said, hey, the chipset doesn't allow us to make a 32-gig a machine that people really need? So uh, I, I don't know if I would have phrased like it exactly that, that way. I mean, but, that's really the only way they could have said it. Well, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's not about because what... The, because it, the reality just, is that a 16-gig machine is not a huge limitation. People, professionals, have been using MacBook Pros for years with, with 16 gig. gigs. Yeah. So we, we're not suddenly just like running out of runway. There's right, but, but this would have an opportunity brand. to explain that that and 16 really gig is the only a lot class of, of people that that make any real sense to have more than 16 gigabytes of RAM are people that are using huge video, which Apple is promoting these machines as being video editing machines. So I mean that's that's somewhat credible to to say that a you know if this is a video machine, what is the options for doing something different? And I really think, I, I think Apple's biggest problem is not that they're marketing the MacBook Pro wrong, is that 
that's the only Mac that they have updated of their entire lineup. They have nothing on the pro end, you know, in terms of like a desktop machine. Um, and I'm saying that the iMacs were updated last year, but I don't know if they're even getting an update at all. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, it, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to frame because some of this, some of the problems that people are describing are really based on the fact that there's not a desktop, but what they really want is a desktop. And when, when you ask for sort of a hybrid, you ask for this kind of desktop that you can fold up and take with you, like these gamer kind of PC machines, PC laptops. Uh, that's not something that Apple's going to make. And it doesn't really fit in with the things that Apple is good at. Making a big, heavy, thick machine that can only run on battery for a short period of time. Th that's not what Apple does. And if that's really what you want, what you really want is an iMac or a, you know, a Mac Pro. And the Mac Pro is from 2013 or something. Yeah, which is obviously not what you really want if you're upset about. So there's there's just not a lot of um, there's not a huge variety of options to pick from. So if you're op if you're wanting to get a, a notebook, these machines are targeted at the huge mainstream center of people who use Macs. Apple is very clear on what people buy and why they buy it, what they find attractive. They're not just sitting in a room like making up this fanciful sketch of a, a product and then just throwing it out there. Apple is one of the most sophisticated operations companies uh, on the planet. And particularly in, I mean, there's just nobody that comes even really that close in terms of making electronics. You know, if you look at Samsung, Samsung is kind of similar in terms of the products they make. And um, they're not as big as Apple in terms of premium phones and, and notebooks and laptops. But in terms of their their manufacturing capability and the scale of them, they they certainly are big, right? Well, they're big in making low end smartphones. But they make well, fewer I, tablets I, than Apple. They make far fewer computers. Really. I'm thinking that they make just about one of everything, including white goods and appliances as well, right? They're they're well, large. I mean, that's other parts. I'm, if, if you're looking at Samsung Mobile, which is kind of like the equivalent of Apple, okay. yeah, and you look at what they're doing, I mean, they're not doing anything really innovative in terms of well, this you know, is a, a building new product category. They're they're right. copying everything Apple does. They, they they just released a copy of the Mac Pro. I mean, that's that's where their innovation lies. Is they you know, hey, we have in, a round computer too. I mean, what what the heck? Right, but they're they're sort of in the middle of of redoing, especially when it comes to their phone line, replanning and redoing what next year's line is going to be like after Whoa. this year's debacle. Yeah, because it burned down. Yeah. yeah. Well, but and it, they bought it, they bought Viv, and they're going to have an assistant, and so they're they're going that route, but they're getting there. They're not there yet today. Yeah, I mean, it would be hard to imagine a a more a, a greater maelstrom of bad juju than what Samsung pulled off this year. I mean, not only with the Note Seven catching on fire and then dealing with it badly, and then you know their fix is to ask people to get another phone, and then you know their washing machines are now exploding, and it's like, come on, and they're being investigated for this criminality in in the whole corruption of South Korea. Yeah. And look at who else is in the PC industry. I mean, HP and Dell and Lenovo. None of those companies are making money selling computers and none of them are doing anything radically interesting. You know, when you look at Apple and you think, you know, are they just like sketching up fanciful ideas and seeing people buy it? That's what, that's what everyone is applauding Microsoft for doing. You know, oh, they're doing innovative stuff. They're not selling you know, what are they selling a billion dollars of stuff a quarter? That sounds like a lot of money, but if you're producing computers, you can't just like coast along doing things like that. So, you know, the tech press is just standing on the edge of their chair, applauding Microsoft and Google for doing fanciful stuff like the, you know, pixel laptop and completely giving them a pass for making things that are incredibly expensive. And then they turn around and say, oh, Apple's doing this thing that, you know, is boring because it's practical and it's expensive because it's, you know, a premium device. It's just, it's just, it's just so hard to even stomach what the tech media is printing these days. It's just, I mean, I guess they've always done that, but it's, it's really got this fever pitch recently. And so when, when you have like a couple of developers come out and say, oh, I wish I had more than 16 gigs of RAM, it becomes this amplified into a, you know, every developer's 
screaming mad at Apple and has pitchforks and is, you know, burning down the trees in their headquarters because they're upset about the Mac Pros. That's kind of all not true. Yeah, we're a lot more boring than that. Yeah. But Apple does have their own problems, right? Try, they, they've been slow about getting the uh, the MacBook Pro orders fulfilled. You know, we, we ran a report recently that says that Wistron is now building the MacBook Pro touch bars because the original supplier fell short. I don't know the full details. I haven't. Um, well, the, it the looks story like they're available. Wrote, it's, it's, it says that the, uh, the keyboard is difficult to build and that the original company was having trouble meeting Apple demand. Uh, this came from the Chinese language economic news daily. Uh, Daily News, rather, uh, quoted by, of course, Digitimes. So it's, yeah, it's I mean, not at all... There's so much of this kind of like... Yeah, it's uh, not clear how many orders we're trying to of details or stuff like that. It gets covered by about Apple because Apple is newsworthy. When you look at every other product in the market, there are delays and there are, you know, they, there's an intent to release something that doesn't happen immediately because of problems. I mean, look at the Microsoft Surface. Over years and years and years, if you actually look at the comments of people using this machine, they say, yeah, it's still doing these kind of um, goes to sleep and doesn't wake up. And it's Even a, on the fourth gen thing? Even on yeah, the newest one? Yeah, it was a third, fourth generation thing that was continuing. Huh. And major problems in how well it works. And of course, you know, Microsoft is not an experienced company in knowing how to build hardware. They just started doing it in the last three or four years these computers mm -hmm. and you know some of it they outsource but same thing with google i mean google like throws out all these ideas and they just have the press applauding them and then you know the, the pixel now is canceled the the pixel the expensive laptop that was like a retina macbook pro that you know kind of a joke the chromebook well, the, pixel. The, so there was always the chromebook pixel that they used to give out at the google io uh, developers convention every year and the how, many, how many times did they do that? Though? I thought well, that was they like did it precisely thing. twice, right? The first Pixel was a $1,300 laptop, the Chromebook, that they made, and it ran Chrome OS. The second Pixel was an Android-based system, which was weird because Chrome always meant, you know, Chromebook always meant running Chrome OS. And this was sort of the first kind of hint of what was going on with Sundar and the bringing together of Android and Chrome. And, and then we had the one that they announced and then canceled. Well, they don't sell the Chromebook Pixel at all anymore, do they? No, well, it's a, it's over a year old now, so no. Yeah, so, I mean, this was a flash in the pan that they did not sell. They were not selling them. They're not profiting from hardware. I mean, you can look at their financial statements. Well, we know their plan is to try and begin doing that now. Yeah, and, and this is like their, what, sixth generation, seventh generation uh, phone where they kind of design the spec and send it out to someone else to build it. And, you know, they're, every year they get this pass of like, oh, there's, this is the real phone. This is the real Google phone. I've been covering this for almost 10 years now. You know, re remember the original Nexus plan, and, and it, was in, it was eight years because that was when the, the Nexus really came about, was to disrupt the carrier market. And they completely failed. Yes. The, the goal was that you'd buy the phone through them and take it to any carrier you want, and that fell over. And so then the, the respin on that plan several years later was Google Fi, which is we will be an MVNO and we will bundle two different providers together, Google Fi being powered by T-Mobile and Sprint, and uh, the phone selecting between whichever network is the strongest at the time. And, and that's been a slow starter, although it's an interesting experiment. And if you look at the the last couple of years under, you know, the, the former ho uh, head of Chrome. Uh, Sundar? His, yeah, his first his first thing was, hey, we're going to come out with super cheap phones. And we're going to come out with a super cheap phone specification, which Android won. And we're going to sell all this stuff to India. Completely failed. We're going to sell super cheap laptop or super cheap notebooks that are so cheap, it's like incredible that they can make them that cheap. And it turns out they weren't very good, and they didn't sell, and they weren't profitable. Now, all of a sudden, they're coming out with iPhone 6 clones that are expensive. Yes. And it's like, what happened to the whole, we're cheap, and we're, you know, we're basically feeding and clothing the naked you know, poor of the world with our smartphones? Well, what and happened is when you have alphabet phone. overlords, right? When you have alphabet overlords who insist that you actually turn a profit, you can't do that. Well, that's ridiculous. They're a, they're a corporation, 
I mean, that's, that's what, that's what you do. I mean, you can't, you can't hire a bunch of people and have an organization and, you know, work indoors and, you know, be floating along in an ideology about open source. I mean, that was all, but, but there are a ton of floating along ideologies, including the literal floating one project loon, right? The idea that we're going to put up balloons with internet access and fly internet access above people. All that is just like hokum that is floating on the real business of Google, which is spyware advertising. That's all they've been making money on. And so they're floating all these ideas about how they're going to have drones delivering coffee and, you know, all this stupid stuff, like really stupid stuff, like the Project Aria. We're going to make a Lego phone that you plug in a new camera when, a, you know, a new block comes out. You know, you give it a little bit of thought and it's like, oh, wait, that is incredibly stupid. It sounds good to people who don't know anything. But when you actually look at the details and how it's going to be implemented and how any of it could possibly work, and you realize, wow, this is a profoundly stupid idea. Yeah, because it would be completely incompatible with each generation of stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at how things change internally every few years, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the fact that you're going to be integrating parts together using a bus that has to be connected, it's, it's very similar to rep replaceable batteries. The idea of a replaceable battery sounds good to somebody who doesn't know anything. But when you start looking at how it actually works, you have to have a sled and all this you know, physical stuff Sled, to accommodate a, a battery door and right. yeah. And you know, the, the fact that when you unplug a battery, your phone's dead now yep. and you plug it in, it has to reboot. Well, why wouldn't you just plug in an external battery pack? There's just a lot of ideas like that, that are, that sound or just apparently sound charge, smart so to people to who don't them. know what they're talking about. Like the tech media, I mean, generally it just goes nuts every time Google offers something and they're just applauding on the edge of their chair. And then they completely forget about it six months or a year later when Google abandons it. And they're, they're ready to applaud the next thing that comes up. So I, 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 I agree with you. It's, it's difficult and it's, it's frustrating to see things that get great launches and great coverage at launch and then turn out to be nothing and, and were predictably nothing all along. It's not so much to, that they're getting coverage. It's that, that people are lying about what reality is. Uh, that's a broader problem than I can address in this podcast. I mean, it, it, there's, there's no... Um, there's no sense of credibility. You have people that are, and it happens in the Apple world too, where somebody will come out with some rumor and they'll say, you know, the Apple watch is going to have a camera on it and it's going to have FaceTime in the second it's generation. And it's like, that was complete nonsense. That doesn't even make sense. And if you look, if you know anything about watch OS, and if you look at any of the implementation, all the work that Apple was doing, they were showing, you know, maybe do some little video clips and this thing with Vine and, you know, being able to, you know, the, the newest thing that they showed off in, with iOS 10 and, and the new watchOS was, you know, somebody comes to your door and knocks and the camera in your HomeKit enabled, you know, video thing sends a little clip to your, to your watch so you can see who's there. I had one of these security cameras that would send me a little video clip or um, video to your watch saying, oh, there's activity at home, check out what's going on. That's, you know, somewhat practical. It's kind of a good idea. The idea that you would FaceTime on a device that has such a little battery that it can barely run all day long if you're and, running. And trying to aim the camera at yourself. Is yeah, I mean, it's just completely absurd. And yet, this story got so much traction from Mike Gurman. I mean, he made it up. And a year and a half later, no one even remembers. No one is, ever, no one is even talking about the fact that this guy who is like, you know, he just knows everything and is so plugged in, and he just made up stuff. And everyone's forgot about it a year and a half later conveniently because, you know, we're off to the next completely ridiculous story that somebody else made up. Yeah. It's just there's this five-second attention span on the internet. and Sorry, what? The, <laughs> and it's killing everything. Everything is going to a yeah. handbasket. Yeah. So, okay. Change, change gears. Change gears. Okay. Um, one truth and one rumor. The truth. Apple is launching online sales of refurbished iPhones. Right? For the first time in many, many years, because the, the first generation iPhone was they allowed sales of refurbs online. Uh, they have begun again selling refurbished iPhones in the U.S. store. What's your thought on this? What's your opinion? Well, they're taking in a bunch of phones from the up, what do they call the upgrade program? The upgrade program. Which... Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It kind of works like a lease, right? 
Yeah, pretty much. Basically, you're you're paying a specific amount every month, and then you just have a new thing you, all the time. You pay a specific amount every month, and by two years, you've paid off the phone. But at the one-year period point, you're allowed to trade it in for whatever new model there is. So it, it's very much like just constantly leasing a new car, and you have sort of a fixed cost. It appeals to kind of business. But, you know, the, the alternative, I mean, the the... The other half of that equation is that Apple is taking in a lot of these phones that are, you know, perfectly good. They can refurbish them and they have a ton of phones to sell. Because if you look at the volume of phones that Apple is selling, people are trying to make a big deal about the fact that, you know, Apple sold more iPhone sixes than the success, or, you know, possibly the, the seven will be about the same number. There's not this huge growth in uh, unit numbers per quarter. However, that number is so much huger than it was three years ago with the, the 5, 5S cycle, that the installed base is growing dramatically. And it continues to grow. So every year there's like a tremendous, you know, another iPhone 6 wave of phones that are being sold. What happens to all those phones that have been sold that are a year old or two years old? That's a lot of people upgrading and a lot of extra phones that, what do you do with those phones? They're, you know, pretty good. So it makes sense to sell those to people who don't want to pay as much for a new phone. So it kind of broadens the, uh, it broadens the market for lower cost phones. And there was also this talk of how does Apple get these into India or other countries so that they have a, a cheaper phone than sort of the, you know, the typical three or four year old version that they're selling at a lower price now as a new phone. And, and getting into India is an interesting question. We'll talk about it in a minute. I, I promised that we'd talk about a rumor for a second. And the rumor is that Apple is going to seek selling a, uh, a Jet White option for the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. Now, obviously, this is a, a somewhat questionable rumor, right? It's not a firm one, but it came from Mako Takara. And they themselves suggested the information could be unreliable. But you know, the Jet Black, the glossy one, has proven really popular. So um, what, do, what do you think about Jet White? Well, if, if you look at the history of Apple's phones, every generation they come out with, the last several generations, they've come out with a new finish. And part of that finish, I mean, part of the idea of the new finish is that it signals that you have the new phone. So when you got the rose gold iPhone 5S when it first came out, people would see it and be like, oh, that's the new one. And, you know, it makes you feel fancy yeah. and uh, this year of course was the flat black and the shiny jet black uh, why would they come out with a color in the middle of the year I'm not well sure they have once it. before you remember the initial white phone well that was because they couldn't make the white one before I mean they tried to come out with the white you're talking about the the, the first four yeah. four yeah yeah I mean they announced that they were going to come out with a black and a white one and the white one was supposed to come out by the end of the year and they couldn't figure out how to make it flawless until I think it was launched around the time of the basically whole year launch. Later. Yeah, it was like the next spring, so it was almost a year late. Um, if you look at how many colors the MacBook comes in, they can certainly come out with a bunch of colors, but I, I don't see why they would make a new color in the middle of the year. Okay, so let's let's you've mentioned India twice now. And we, we've talked in the past on this show about how Apple is seeking incentive, how, is, is thinking about setting up Indian manufacturing. And then part of the reason behind that is that in order to set up uh, corporate stores in India, they have to have manufacturing in India to satisfy legislation. And Yeah, they, I thought they got sort of a waiver on that, but I don't, I don't know what the details are. I can't think right off. But I think part of what, even to sell refurbs, they have to refurb them in India. I'm not positive about that. I know that we talked about them possibly getting a waiver for this, but uh, the story that we published says that Apple is seeking financial handouts from the Indian government before setting up manufacturing unit in the country. The incentives are connected to the Department of Revenue and the Department of Electronics and Information Technologies. And uh, this this was an official in India speaking saying that they're doing their due diligence for quite some time. The Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion will write to both departments regarding this communication for their views. Um they're, they're looking to get basically a modified special incentive package scheme, which would provide subsidies if they can actually set up shop in one of the special economic zones uh, designed to lure the foreign firms. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a typical situation where you're 
negotiating to get the best possible situation to move into a, an area. And it's not unheard of, right? I mean, they've they've got the manufacturing it's facility. It's not, not unheard of. I mean, it's like every time they do anything, they look for the best way to do it. Yeah, but they've got manufacturing in Ireland. And as I understand it, Foxconn manufactures iPhones in Brazil to comply with the same kind of regulation. So what, what do you think about opening up India like this? Yeah, I mean, it totally, it, it's a huge market. And it's one that's very difficult for Apple to run into with their current lineup, unlike China, because China already has, you know, if you don't know anything about China, which I didn't know, you know, a few years ago, um, you think of it as being a bunch of poor people. If you're a dumb American, um, I went to China and it's like, whoa, this is Blade Runner. Okay. So where, where did you go in China and when did you go? Uh, last, was it last year, last spring or the spring before? I think it was last spring. Um, not this year, but like the previous year ago, spring, I, I was in Hong Kong and I thought I should go across the border. And so, um, right across the border from Hong Kong is Shenzhen where Apple's does a lot of the, the early manufacturing that city didn't exist in 1980. And now it's, it's a massive city. I've seen some big cities and this is like, holy crap. There's like hundred story buildings rising in tandem. And you go further up into China, I went to uh, Guangzhou, which is what we used to call Canton. Um, it is massive, like breathtakingly huge. And it's under construction. I mean, like there's just an entire, you know, a major city. It looks like San Francisco is being built the whole financial district all at once. And then you look in the horizon and you see like all these other like <laughs> cities. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. And there are tons of millionaires and billionaires in China. So there's a, a lot of people. Apple can just open up sales and all of a sudden they had tons of sales that were as big as the United States. I mean, Apple's phone sales in China are neck and neck with their phone sales in, in America. And I think App Store sales are, are now kind of, I think they just passed App Store sales in, in the United States. So China is a huge ready to go market. India is not the same. India is emerging, and one of the things Tim Cook said is it's a very young country. You know, we think of China as being young because the average age is like 40. The average age in India is something like 20-something. So it's a huge um, emerging middle class that isn't quite emerged as the way China has, but it's going to. And Apple's already setting up, you know, major, I think that's where their biggest maps development thing is and they, they also set up a new app development stuff. I mean Apple is doing so much expansion in so many different places. It'll be really interesting once the fruits of that start rolling in. I mean you're we're already seeing maps improving. There's a lot of good things about maps, but there's it's still I mean, Apple search is so awful. And integration with Siri. The, the results leave a little to be decided. So, I mean, not, not, not just bad results, but just really frustrating. I mean, you say, hey, Siri can give me, you know, address to Hollywood and Vine. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then, you know, you go in and you type it in Hollywood and Vine. It's like, oh, here it is. And it's like, what? what? How did that happen? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you say, hey, can you give me directions to the store that's around the corner? And it's like, here, you know, outer Here's nowhere in, Utah. in Iowa. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. I just want to shake Siri sometimes. But, um, yeah, I mean, Apple really needs to get, I think it's primarily search. Because we're very familiar with how Apple is very good at some things that they're so good at them that they make it look really easy until other companies start trying to copy them. So, you know, like Google trying to copy smartphones, Microsoft trying to copy MacBooks. When you start using them, you're like, wow, this is this is a more complicated product than I realized because this person, they have a lot of money. They're not able to copy it. And conversely, things like Google search is so effortlessly brilliant that it isn't quite obvious how much effort they put into it over the last you know decade. But when you do a search and you, you can basically type like blackout drunk, any phrase into Google and it will be, did you mean to say... <laughs> this and it's like yes of course 
Apple is not there. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm wondering how Apple is going to get there because Google has put a lot of effort into that. I, I don't know how easy it will be for Apple to figure that out. And they're doing a lot of work with machine learning and they're, they're talking about examples of how they're figuring things out. And there's some really clever stuff that they're doing. Um, I've been liking the fact that Maps just figures out where you left your car. You don't have to drop a pin. It just says you were driving and now you're not driving anymore. So there's your car. Um, works really well. But there's other things that they just don't really have down yet. And one, yeah, obviously one of them is search, coordination of Siri and typing things in. I really wish Siri just had like a command line interface sometimes where you could just type it in. And some of the stuff with iOS 10, you, you do a search result and it's like, here's your search result and it's like not even editable. And you're like, wait, that's not exactly what I want, but I, if I could edit that, that would be what I want. And instead it's just like, nope, start over from scratch. Sometimes I wish Apple had, they just need to have like a community of people that try their stuff and say, this doesn't work. <laughs> you would think that, you know, they have 100,000 employees. You'd think that there would be more feedback saying, hey, you know, the way we implemented this is completely ridiculous. Maybe we should change it. But Yeah, but yet that's not happening. Apple should give me a job where I just like say, hey, Apple, this this is dumb. Should <laughs> I'll be their new Steve Jobs. <laughs> I'll just like sit, sit in a corner office and be like, this, too complicated. This Six, is dumb. Six, six. This, I want to be able to do it. Yeah, too bad. Too bad I didn't invent this whole Apple thing. Mm. <laughs> I have ideas where I take it. I can't imagine. <laughs> we didn't talk about the touch bar. Talk about the touch bar. You want to talk about the touch bar? Talk about the touch bar. I think I talked about this before one time. Back in like 2009, I imagined uh, how Apple could set apart their MacBooks from everything else by basically putting an iOS device in place of the trackpad. So instead of a, a glass touch pad, you had basically a like an iPhone, iPad touch, you know, like iPod touch in your screen. And a lot of people said, why would you use that? And well, it's like a made a lot of sense to me. But so what Apple did was a little bit different in that they took the top strip of the keyboard, which is a bunch of function keys that you sort of use sometimes, but and they've taken a lot of ideas. It, it, it's actually, if you read the human interface guidelines, it's really smart how they implemented it. There's a lot of thought that went into it in not only making it look really nice, but also in having layers of different kinds of functionality that are expressed in a way that is very useful. So part of it is, you know, by default, if you're running Windows or something on your computer, it just acts like function keys. But when you, um, so if you run a specific app, you know, of course, like Final Cut or or Photoshop or something, the app itself can take over that strip or part of it and give you controls for doing things that work in tandem with the keyboard right? and a, a pointer controller like the touchpad and can be used kind of in conjunction. So there's a lot of things, there's a lot of times when you're doing things, you're pointing with your finger on the touchpad, and then you're doing a keyboard command shortcut. But if you had slider controls and buttons on the top that change in relation to what you're doing, that's even smarter. Right. And the benefit to this is that you're, uh, you're not really removing your hand from the general area. You're still at the keyboard. Right. And you're also not putting your hand on the screen, which is fatiguing and also, you know, messes up your screen. Uh, the other, uh, couple things it does is one it takes the control panel which is the top menu bar stuff and puts it on in quick range and secondly they did this really cool thing with the menu controls so for your app it works very much like uh i think i'm trying to think when it was actually kind of presented in, in os 10 back in the day but the idea that you have an editable row of buttons on that every app kind of works the same so the buttons on the top of your app window, you could move them around or edit them or choose which ones you want to have up there. They've implemented a similar thing with you just kind of drag it down and it becomes part of the touch bar. So there's a number of different 
different ideas that they've kind of layered together in a really smart way. And it's sort of a premium feature. It's like a, a it's not just a display, but it's also linked to a processor that runs it, which is very closely related to iOS. It's or watch OS. It's, it's all kind of the same stuff running on an ARM processor. So it's kind of essentially like a, a an Apple watch embedded into the screen. So it's kind of similar to what I was imagining in terms of making something look distinctive and, uh, but it's also, I was talking to John Gruber at the event and he was, you know, saying basically my idea for a, a touchpad on a, basically a lit up touchpad that you can control, your hand would be over the top of that most of the time. Whereas the top row function keys are is less obstructed by your hands on the keyboard, even when you're typing. So you see it and it's right there. It's like within range of your finger. Yeah. So it's kind of a baby step towards a fully touchpad. But they know how to do palm rejection and things like that too. So it's not. Yeah, you know, but it's more, more obscuring. It'd be harder to see the screen if your hands are kind of on top of it. You'd have to move your hands to see the screen. Yeah. So it's an interesting way to, to use multiple screens. Usually on a laptop, you think of a multiple screen. It's you're plugging in a display and it's next to you. So this is actually embedding a secondary display in a novel way where it becomes part of the keyboard and kind of extends the idea of a keyboard. One of the things that Apple, that you keep hearing out of Apple when they release something new, first, you know, was like the iPod and then iPhone, is the whole idea of computers, particularly with Apple, since the Macintosh, has been how can we use a computer that bitmaps a display so we can do anything we want on the, on the screen? How do we make an interface, a human interface, that works with that? And with the mouse, with the Mac, it was a mouse or a trackpad where you're pointing around at different objects on Windows and things like that. With iOS, it's direct manipulation with your finger on things. And with the touch bar, it's kind of a combination of those two things where you're taking some of that direct manipulation and you're using it as a, as a keyboard. You're using it in conjunction with the keyboard as a, a, a different way to have a secondary display on your machine. And because there's some expense involved in doing it, um, and they're, you know, they're figuring out, they put it on their highest machines first. So these machines, like we're, we were talking about earlier, they're not cheap machines, but I, I don't really think they're significantly more expensive than the higher end MacBook Pros have ever been. I mean, whenever I bought the higher end MacBook Pros are always been kind of like, oh wow, $2,500 in that kind of range. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know. I've, what is the lowest in 13 inches? Like $1,500? Yeah. And I, I've, well, that's the 13 inch this year, but right. in the years past, it's been a 15 inch for that price. And the difference between the lower end 15 is, you know, uh, is it like 17 or is that, am I thinking of something else? Is that the high I end 13? I think you're, I'm not sure. Let's take a look here. I had that open a moment ago. And the truth is I knew this. I knew this cold before we started the call. But you know what happens? You start talking and you forget which one is which, right? I sometimes forget before I start talking even. Oh. <laughs> so the the 13-inch prices are, are uh, 1500 seven, uh, 1800 and 2000 And the 15-inch prices are uh, 2400 and 2800 so it is it is no longer possible to buy a 15 inch for anything south of two thousand dollars and but it used to did be that change i mean when was the 15 inch significantly less than that i i don't know i need to look back but i feel like it was not that long ago that you were able to buy a, a machine a 15 inch for under two thousand bucks we know it was six years ago when I bought one for 1500 because that's when it was then. And it stayed that way for a couple of years for sure. But that was 2010. Okay. So in 2013, oh, 2013. say that was still, I suppose that was still true, right? I'm looking back. I would have to look. I don't remember. I'm look it up. But yeah. You know, the, the, but you understand the, the frustration that provides. So... Yeah, I mean, if there was that much movement, the 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 MacBook Airs, the Apple's product line has kind of been shifting around because when the when the Air came out, it was originally like a super high end, you know, this yeah. is a super light, super thin, ultra light 
device that you're paying a premium for because it's an SSD and all these kind of things where the MacBook and even the MacBook Pro line was less expensive because they use different components, yeah. spinning hard drives and whatever. And now the MacBook Air is sort of the entry level because it's a non-retina display. Okay. It's pretty basic. So, so digging back, a mid-2014 15-inch Core i7 was $2,000. Um, and the... Which is uh, right in line with what it is now. Because the 15-inch starts at 2000 Oh, that That's the... That's the existing one. So you can still buy that 15 inch for 2000. It's a Core i7. It's doesn't have the, you know, doesn't have the new strip. Yeah. But the, the existing or the, you know, they're still selling that $2,000 15 inch option. Right. So if I look at the 2013 machines, they were even more expensive initially. So the shift happened between 2012 and 2014, basically. And if you look at Apple's prices over over the long term, there is a sh- kind of a shift that happens in um, in parallel to how much competition Apple has, how much pricing pressure. So, like when the first iPhone came out, it was like it was expensive. There was nothing like it. People bought it no matter what the price, but it was kind of like a, a, it was still kind of a niche thing when it first came out. They immediately dropped the price down because they realized this could be something we can sell in pretty significant volumes. So they dropped the price dramatically. And then the next year, the 3G, uh, 3G and 3, 3GS, the next two years, came out with sort of a plastic body to make it cheaper. Yeah. And then as everybody else was, you know, that's when Android was first started to gain some traction and it was like, Hey, we have fancy features and we have higher resolution screens and, um, some of these, uh, kind of premium features. Apple came out with the iPhone four and it was a, you know, compared it to a Leica camera. And then the five is like shiny and super fancy looking. And then the six is, you know, kind of luxuriously higher end. So the, the less, and Apple is, Apple is having less and less competition. If you look at, you know, who, who is challenging them, for a while, Samsung was really challenging Apple, like in 2014, in yeah. terms of smartphones, and they really bit it with the the six, and they were just starting to kind of go back to where they were in the last year, and then they completely, you know, literally imploded, blew into flames, and shot out that gray, yeah. scary smoke. Um, in terms of laptops, it's kind of a similar thing. So when you have this really hard pricing pressure, Apple has put a lot of effort into selling Mac, uh, iPads and the Mac lineup has basically become more of a pro thing. So the Macs, Macs are basically computers that cost more than a thousand dollars now. And iPads are the alternative to, you know, things like netbooks and, um, the Google netbook, Chromebook. Yeah. And so- there's not a lot of pricing pressure in the high end of notebooks right now. I mean, Microsoft, Microsoft doesn't sell cheap, that their service machines are quite expensive, very expensive for being PCs. And so if you look at Apple's prices for the MacBook Pros, that's reflective in that. It's not just that they raise their prices, it's that they've decided we're selling this on the higher end, so we can put in higher end stuff. We can put in a really fast as a D controller. We can give it, you know, more RAM than a surface. We can, you know, charge this pricing tier for it because that's what people are gonna pay because there's nobody else selling really nice machines that are as um, attractive. All right. Well, I, I, I want to wrap this up. So uh, do you have a parting thought for us? Uh, well, Apple is just sending me a review model of the Touch Bar um, MacBook Pro. So I'm excited to 13 or 15? Get, get my hands on it. About 15. Nice. So I'm getting my hands on it and trying out the trying out the tandem two-handed controls and stuff. Interesting cool. Thing. Got to play with a little bit at the event, but um, I like to put it through paces. So when you get that, let's talk again and uh, tell everyone about it. The other interesting thing I just, I just wanted to throw out is we were talking about prices. Um, the The cost of the MacBook Airs without, there's, there's 
older versions or the the basic 13 inch that doesn't have the the touch bar right the old then, macbook pro yeah so the price difference between those there's a new 13 without a, the touch bar as well it just has conventional buttons yeah that's the 1499 one yeah so if you compare the price of that with the price of the touch bar one uh it looks like it's kind of a difference of three hundred dollars but right. not the same machine they have much faster processor options and you, you get a lot more for your 300 is what you're saying yeah so it's, they've made it kind of difficult to compare like how much exactly that touch bar costs as a premium feature, which is, you know, standard operating procedure for Apple. Sure. So something to well, think well, about. We will, we will talk again when you've had that machine for a little bit of time and can tell us about it. Um, on our website, just closing thought from me, we've got a video of a comparison between the iPhone 7 Plus portrait mode versus a DSLR. We're comparing it with a Canon 5D Mark IV, and it's it's kind of interesting to see how it comes out. You know, the, the they aren't the same, but it's uh, it's something that can get you some kind of similar results. So take a look at the video. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, Dan, where can people read more about you online? I'm on Twitter at Daniel Aaron E R A N. And, of course, Apple Insider. And, like I said, we're doing the throw-up pictures on the Instagram feed. So if you like to check out pictures of stuff, we've been putting up some pictures of the portrait mode in action, what you can do with it. And some of those are kind of cool to check out. So what's the Instagram username to look for for that? Apple Insider underscore official. Cool. I'm your host, Victor Marks. I'm here on Apple Insider, and this has been fantastic episode 94. Can you believe that? We've been doing this for this long. Um, if you liked this episode, if you like listening to us in general, please feel free to go ahead and mention us on iTunes. Uh, if you give us a positive review, that's wonderful. If you don't, I understand. Uh, we're very grateful that you listen, and we will be back next week with more. 